Philippians chapter 3, um, the last time we were here, we were in verses, really we concluded with verses 13 and 14, particularly with verse 14, and how Paul said that I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we found out about Paul's spiritual priorities, and I think you ought to have some spiritual priorities. But we also found out that if Paul was going to press toward the mark, that he was going to have to forget some things that were behind him, the hurts that he endured, the failures that he suffered, how far he had already come. And then he was going to have to reach forth under those things which are before. He was going to have to look at the things that were not finished. And he was going to have to look at the things that weren't learned and the people that had yet to be reached. So in doing those things, he's putting himself in a position talking about what he is making the focal point of his life. I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But then we get to verse 15, and he really changes the whole narrative. Now I say he, the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You know, God takes, and for probably seven verses, Paul repeatedly talks about his own personal self. He talks about how that I may know him and Verse 13, that I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, and how I press toward the mark. And he's using himself as a personal example, but when he gets to verse number 15, he changes the direction, and now he says, let us, therefore as many as be perfect. And he goes on through the passage in verse 17, you have us for an example Verse 20, our conversation is in heaven. And he begins talking about in the plural. And here's what I really believe. I believe what he's doing is he's giving his story not to get glory to himself, but to be able to motivate some other people that are coming behind him. One, one writer said it this way, that Paul is trying to use his life to encourage others to run farther than he'd run. Could I ask you a question? Now, how many of you parents would like to see your children walk closer to the Lord and achieve more for Him than you've ever achieved. I would love to see that. I would like to see my children, my grandchildren go much further. And it's not about self-glory when He uses these illustrations personally. I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I'm reaching forth of those things which are before and I'm pressing toward that mark because I want to motivate you to run your race. I want you to stretch yourself. That's why He says, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Perfect doesn't mean sinless. Perfect just means that you're throughly furnished, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Throughly furnished, that you're meat for the job. James 1 makes perfect meaning entire, lacking nothing. And he says, there are some that are perfect. Let us be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. Nevertheless, where until we have already attained. So we have achieved some things. We have suffered the loss of things and we have learned about who he is and we've learned about his power of the resurrection and we're pressing toward that mark and there are other people that are doing that with us. And he's saying, listen, these men, nevertheless, whereunto we have all retained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. He's trying to encourage others and then he comes to the heart of what I want to preach on for the next few minutes. He starts talking about two different kinds of examples. If you look at the first one, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. In other words, 
Paul is saying, hey, guys, I want you to follow the example that I'm giving you of pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to take a look at me, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an example. So it's not just me, but others around me. There are others that are pressing toward the prize. They have spiritual priorities. They have, they have a life that is trying to know him and the power of his resurrection. They're forgetting things that are behind and they're reaching forth unto those things which are before. And he says, those are the people that you need to set your attention on and you need to get in behind them and you need to follow them and live the way that they're living so that you can also achieve that same prize. Now, I'm, I'm going to say tonight, I'm glad that this church is full of men and women who are living a life trying to press toward the prize of Jesus Christ. If you're a young man or a young couple, it would be, it would be in your best interest to pay attention to people that have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ and have a love for the Bible and have a standard of holiness that they are not trying to be part of the world, but they're trying to achieve something that's much higher than the world. They're trying to please the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that may mean their music is different. That may mean their dress is different. That may mean their conversation is different, that their focus and purpose is different. But I'm telling you right now, if you want to win the prize, one of the things you need to do is you need to get behind somebody that's running that direction. You know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced our world is becoming so much like the world that was in Paul's day. Immorality, listen, immorality today is something that is whatever you want, however filthy you want it to be, whatever you want it to be, just put it out there in front of everybody, and if it doesn't hurt somebody, then it's all right. Immorality is rampant. Paganism is on the rise. Atheism is on the rise. Agnosticism is on the rise. I'm, te I'm telling you right now, there's a hatred of Christianity. Somebody sent me a text right before church that they had bombed an independent Baptist church in California, set off an explosion, an IED, the same thing you find in Iraq and Afghanistan because they didn't like the position that a pastor had taken on the issue of LBGTQ. Now, I think maybe the man may have went a little far, but I'll tell you this, all I'm saying is he didn't go as far as some of the other th people that are out there like Black Lives Matters and Antifa. They've got all kind of incendiary language in it, and right now it doesn't look like there's this great urge, hey, we need to silence that because the world is becoming a place where Christianity that has a standard of holiness is not enjoyed by our country anymore. It's not something they want around them. And they, hey, they may not want it around them, but I want to be around those kind of people because I believe they're running for a prize. I believe that they've got their direction right and they're headed the right direction. And look, they may think that you are as crazy as you can be. I heard a man say a long time ago, he said, you may think I'm crazy, I'm nuts, but I'm screwed on the right boat. Amen. I know where I am. I know who I am. I know what direction I'm going. That's Paul. Paul knows what, listen, we got a lot of young college men and women here tonight. And if you're not careful, you're going to see things on the internet that are constantly changing. Somebody taking issue with something. In fact, I don't need to want to run ahead, but if you look there in verse number 18 and 19, you have examples of people enjoying their liberty. For many of you of whom I've told you often, or for many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross. That's the opposite example. These are people whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They take great liberty enjoying that. It's amazing to me that there are people that name the name Christ and they encourage other people to live a carnal life and excuse the sin that they partake in. That is not who you want to follow. That is, not, that is not liberty. Now, those people are enjoying, they, they are an example of enjoying their liberty. And Paul says, no, I want you to be followers together of me. Now, I've heard it said so many times, somebody, you know, they take issue about following a man. We shouldn't follow a man. Well, 
I want you to put a mark right there in Philippians and go, if you would, just a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, just a minute. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. How many of you still with me? Would you say amen? amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm talking about your example that you're following tonight. Who are you following? Who are you following? <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And Paul says, I want, I want you to follow me. 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look there at verse number 15, and he says this. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, in other words, you get all these people out there telling you about Christ, what he believes, yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He's reminding those Corinthians, I brought you the gospel, I led you to Christ. Verse 16, wherefore I beseech ye, be ye followers of me. You know, I'd like to say tonight, you know, it would be a good idea to follow the person that led you to Christ instead of following the person that you see on some uh, Christian television or some other church that tells you how you ought to be doing it. Because if they weren't interested in your soul before you got saved, why in the world would you be listening to them after you get saved? Do you understand that? If they weren't interested in your soul before you got saved, why would you pay attention to what they have to say about dress or music or anything else? And then notice what he also says there in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now again, he told them, be followers of me. Verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Paul says, I'm following Christ and I want you to follow me. I want you to take and put your sights on where I'm headed and what I'm doing. I want, you to, I want you to be a partaker of what I'm partaking in. I want you to love what I love. And again, this is not something he's telling them. It's something he's asking them to enter into. It's, there's, there is a difference between someone telling you what to do and someone showing you what to do. There is a huge difference in somebody giving you an example to follow and somebody giving you a lecture on what you ought to do. And Paul is trying to tell these Philippian believers, look, be ye followers of me. I am taking and I'm counting the loss of all things that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering, the power of his resurrection. And I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's an urgency. There is a, there's a zeal behind him. I, I really believe this. I believe there were some people that were jealous of Paul. I believe they, don't, they didn't like his zeal. They didn't like the fact that he knew his Bible. They didn't like the fact that he saw people saved and that he had all kind of authority God gave him. Hey, young people, listen to me. Hey, are you listening? You know what you need to do? You need to get your attention on somebody that's doing something for God and follow them. Get behind somebody that's got some excitement about them. I would tell you don't follow somebody that's dead. If you follow somebody that's dead, you might end up that way. Follow somebody that's got some life, somebody that's got some joy, somebody that's excited about what God has for them, somebody that's talking about how good God is. I would rather follow them than somebody that's talking about how that the black helicopters are going to come and take us all away because whether they do or don't, you need to give your attention to him. So who are you following? Who are you following? I couldn't believe that young missionary got up there the other day, said when he was six or seven that I was his hero. And uh, I, I didn't know him, uh, really. I, I, I remember Brother Jim Rowland preaching in his church. I don't remember having a lot of conversation with Brother Jeremy. Uh, I did years later. I, I remember having some conversation. But he, he was looking at a preacher. I, you know what I would say? I would say encourage your children to look at people that are living a godly life. Live one in front of them. Amen. Amen. Paul's saying, I'm, 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 I'm leaving a trail that you can follow and come out at the right place where the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus is. Amen. If you'll get behind me, I'm going to come out at that place. And you can run on farther than I run. But I want you to get in behind where I am and follow me. Now, the alternative to that, go back if you would to Philippians chapter, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 gives the other side of that coin. And the other side of that coin is an example of somebody not pressing for the prize, but somebody that's just enjoying their liberty, marking their time. Verse 18, now watch, he says, 
for many walk of whom I have told you often. So Paul wasn't afraid to point out somebody that was being a bad example. Hey, Mom, Dad, I think you and I, we ought to live a positive example in front of our children, but you ought not to be afraid to point out a poor example. Now, I know that didn't go over very well, but it's in the Bible. Look at it again. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. Somebody says, well, these are all lost people. Well, then why is Paul weeping? Why, why, why does Paul say that he's telling you about these people and he's weeping? You know, I think, I think he's looking at people that used to be walking in the right path, living the right life, people that were trying to take and press toward the prize and had forgotten that old life and were reaching forward to something that God had given them. I think he's thinking about men, women that he knew like Demas. Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. And instead of getting angry about it, it convicted me as I thought about it. Instead of getting angry, it says that he was weeping. You know, Jeremiah does the same thing in the book of Lamentation. When he looks around at all the children of Israel and how they've rejected God and where they are, instead of being angry about it, he is broken over what his people are doing and how they've rejected God. You know what? God help me. God, help me to see people as what they really are and not just get upset because they're not on my side anymore. If they're born again, it ought to bother me when they step out and follow the world. It ought to trouble my heart. It ought to be something that I'm not happy about. It ought not to be something that I have joy in or that I, that I have some sort of bravado about saying, well, at least I'm on the right side. Look, if your children go out into the world, it ought to trouble us that they left and followed after the way of the world. And he says, I'm weeping over those. So I believe these people, I believe, they're, I believe they're part of the church. Now, I know somebody says, well, what about the fact that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ? You see that? Now, I want you to think with me now. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. That's a pretty bold statement to make about somebody. How would you be an enemy of the cross of Christ? One way you could be an enemy of the cross of Christ is this. You could challenge the power of, of the cross to bring salvation. You could say that it, it's Christ plus baptism. It's Christ plus your good works. It's Christ plus taking and treating your neighbor well. You could add something to that. But you know what we all believe here tonight? We believe that what Jesus Christ finished at the work of, uh, at, at Calvary was a finished work and there's nothing you need to add to it that it's sufficient to pay for the penalty of the sins of man. We believe that. But, you know, we're not alone in that. There are a lot of churches that believe that. There are a lot of people that believe that. I know you might not say, well, I don't know. I, there, I'm t- I've met people that aren't of our denomination that, that believe that the, that the cross is the power of Christ unto salvation, that it has power to save. And boy, I'm telling you tonight, I'm glad the cross has power to save. And I'm not going to say anything that limits that. But, you know, you could be an enemy of Christ if you challenge the power of the cross to save. Listen to me. Listen to me. But I think you could be an enemy of the cross of Christ if you challenge the power of the cross to transform lives. In other words, the cross has enough power to take away the penalty of sin, but it doesn't have enough power to transform a life. In other words, Jesus Christ going and hanging on a cross and rising on the third day was able to deliver us from the penalty of our sin. But no, he's not able to deliver us from the power of our sin and so we just have to kind of go along and adopt this idea that hey it's just it's just about me loving Jesus and it's just about me saying that that it's about the gospel I I disagree with that I'm telling you right now hey you listen to me tonight church I believe there are people that are the enemy of the cross of Christ because they deny the transforming power that he wrought there on Calvary's hill in fact I'm gonna say it this way Jesus changes lives Amen. Jesus doesn't just deliver from sin. Jesus has the power to take a man who was a drunk and make him somebody that's a Bible believer. (laughs) Amen. God has the ability to take a man that was foul mouth and let words of praise come out of his mouth. God's able to take a man who was a sorry husband and a wife who was a sorry wife and put them back together and make it an example of what marriage ought to be. Amen. (laughs) Amen. So why would we have people that would challenge the power of the cross 
to transform a life because they're more interested in enjoying their liberty. But I like this kind of music. And come on, preacher, there's nothing wrong with a little wine cooler at meal time, and nothing wrong with having a beer when you're watching a ball game. And come on, preacher, it really doesn't matter if we dress this way and we're immodest. After all, we're going to heaven and we love Jesus. I disagree. Amen. I disagree. I, I think if the cross has power to save, it has the power to transform. Amen. I don't need to peddle a message that says Jesus has enough power to save you from your penalty of your sin, but not enough power to change your life. Don't you love that verse? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. <laughs> Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you see an example of somebody that wants to enjoy their liberty? They have become an enemy of the cross of Christ. And Paul points that out. Look at the second thing it says about them. Whose end is destruction. Their life is going to lead to destruction. I came out of a church in Alabama um, as a boy that my grandfather brought out of the Southern Baptist Convention and um, that the pastor that uh, was there when I was a teenager that he decided he was going to take it back into the convention. And they completely changed the way that they um, they completely changed the way they dress. So if you were to go to the church that I was raised in, instead of there being a distinction between men and women, there's really not much of a distinction. There's really, no, nobody really has any kind of standard of dress. They, they went to a praise and worship team. So they've got praise and worship and there's, there's things on the wall. And, and there are people that just loved it. Oh, look at the liberty we have now. Look at the liberty we have now. They would have, they would have uh, fellowships with the young adult classes, the college classes and go out on the Tennessee River and they would, they, would, they would water ski, guys and girls together and dressed exactly the way you'd find anybody in the world and they'd have pool parties. And they, boy, they'd have that and the teenagers, they would go to those things and people would say, oh, praise, what, what a, such liberty we have here. We're just, we're free now. We're finally, we're free from all that. And you know what happened later on? They had so many people in that church, young couples, that ended up in divorce because of the immorality between them in the church. And it destroyed homes and it destroyed children. And if my former pastor was sitting right there, I'd tell him the mistake you made by taking and giving Christians liberty to indulge themselves led to their own destruction. And you young men and young ladies, you don't want to follow that place at all. It may sound, it, listen, it may sound pleasant. Oh, if I could just get rid of all the clothing stand. I mean, there are people now that don't like the fact that we have a standard of dress at the Christian school and a standard of dress at the home. And, you know, there's no place that we've posted anywhere around here about a standard of dress at church. But I'm glad that we have ladies to dress like ladies. I'm glad we have men to dress like men. I'm glad we don't have men walking around in skirts. Can I say that again? I'm glad we don't have men walking around in skirts. You see, we've come full circle on this thing now to where we have men dressed like women going into our libraries reading books to children and it's destroying our, it's destroying our society. And all I'm just saying is this, listen, the, the idea is if you follow somebody that's an example of liberty, oh, we just got liberty. I'm going to enjoy my liberty. The end is the destruction. Then look what else it says. Whose God is their belly? Well, that could be some dangerous preaching, couldn't it? Whose God is their belly? You know what I, I take from that? I take from that this, that indulgence is their God. Whatever satisfies is what I'm going to give my deference to. Doesn't matter what it is. I'm just going to say, if it satisfies, I'm going, to, I'm going to indulge in it. Whose God is their belly. And there's so many things that come to mind, whether it's pride, self-esteem. I want to feel good about myself. I, I want other people to like me. Or whether it's indulging in immorality. You know, there are some, pe are, there are some people that think that it is all right to have an affair as long as your spouse doesn't find out about it. 
You know what the Bible calls that? Adultery. That's what the Bible calls that. Yeah, but I want to indulge in it. I want to I sow my wild oats. It's the same thing. I get to be a teenager in high school. I get to graduate at 18. And now I get to go sow my wild oats. And I get to go out there in the prom and spring break and indulge in all that. Hey, you need to put a lid on what you indulge. Because if that God, if that God is leading you, he's going to lead you the wrong direction. Amen. Wrong direction. Yeah, but I, I want to listen to this kind of music. And I want to enjoy these things. And there's no check and balance on that. And all I'm saying is he says, their God is there. But look at the next thing, whose glory is in their shame. It's amazing to me how many people call good evil and evil good. Now, now you know, I, I know there are people that don't appreciate the fact that we have a hymn book. I personally like the fact that we have a hymn book. I think a hymn book is in the Bible. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But there are people that make fun of churches like this. They mock. Churches like this. I was in one. My wife and I sitting there. And uh, I don't know if she's here tonight or not. Is she here? I just want to be careful about what I'm saying. We walked into a church that we went to go get some discipleship material from. And this is all the way back probably 1995. That church is already moving a different direction. And I went and sat down. And I don't know if she remembers, but there was a lady that sat down close to us. And she had a really short it was either a skirt or a pair of shorts on set right there. And, and, and the, whole, the whole thing, it was just very odd in, in that we're in this church. And, and, the, and the, title of their, the title of their conference was Grace and Truth. So we're going to pit truth against grace. And in the middle of all that, I can still remember it. The, the guy got up and he said, for those of you that still need a hymn book, we have some underneath your pew. Well, you know, when you're about 24, 25, 26, 12, I don't know how old I was there, 30. Anyway, when you're younger, I wanted to grab that hymn book and said, I got one right here. For those of you who need a hymn book, whose glory is in their shame. I, I had a kid tell me at, on, in Memphis, on Beale Street, outside the Hard Rock Cafe, we're out there passing out tracks and preaching on the street and trying to evangelize. And I've got a group of kids coming to me. And I asked him, I said, hey, listen, can I talk to you about eternity? And this young man looked at me. He said, I'm saved. I said, well, what are you doing out here tonight? He said, well, we're just here to enjoy the music. I said, is that why you're drinking beer? He said, my daddy's a missionary. Well, that's good. I'm glad. I'm born again. He said, listen, you, you don't have to dress like you guys dress to say that you're saved. We talked about that a little while. And finally, after sitting there talking to that guy, he was bragging about, I have liberty to drink if I want to drink, and I've got liberty to be out here and party with these people if I want to party with them. And finally, I said, you know what? You're not representing Jesus Christ very well, are you? Boy, when I said that, there was a lady, this young lady, she got mad. Boy, she got, it, you talking about lit her fuse. I'm talking about the head shaking kind. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> she's going to tell me about how she's saved and all that. And you know what, that, that young guy, he looked at her and he said, be quiet. He's right. And I still remember that young man pouring that beer out right there. And he said, we need to go home. We don't need to be here. You know why that happened? Because somebody wasn't afraid to stand up and say something about truth and being right. Now, I know that people don't, but they'll mock, they'll mock that. They make fun of folks coming to church in a tight. Look, if you, if you can stand and comment about a basketball game between two teams that nobody has any idea where their location is, and one team is 1 and 12, and the other team is 2 and 13, and you've got a tie on, and you're going to comment, and you're going to talk to the coach. If you think that's important enough for you to wear a suit and a tie, I think what I'm doing right now is more important. I need to be wearing a coat and a tie. What I got to say is more important than what they're saying on Fox News. Amen. MSNBC, CBS, ABC, Newsmax. Throw the list out there. Hey, what we're talking about is about eternity. Well, you got to wear that suit and tie. You think that makes you, I, I heard it. Y'all just think it makes you holy. 
They mock that. And then they glory in their shame. And look what we can do. Oh, does that bother you? You need to worry less about it bothering me and whether or not it bothers God. Look <laughs> at the next thing. Boy, y'all getting quiet. You're going to make me nervous now. I'm just preaching what's in the text. You know, he says, who mind earthly things. They don't think anything about eternity. They just think about right here, right now. And that could be spending your life to chase that dollar, to be able to gain what you want. And all I can see is right here, right now. Church, you know what we believe? There's something a whole lot more important than right here, right now. There's an eternity. And what he's saying is, you don't need to follow this example. This is an example of somebody who is enjoying their liberty, not pressing toward the prize. This is not about somebody who's trying to win Jesus. This is about somebody who's trying to take and say, boy, I sure enjoy what God's given me. Now, if you'll notice verse number 20, and 21, and I'll be finished. There's, there's two reasons that we ought to give the right example, and they're given right here. Look at the first one. The reason that we ought to give an example of pressing toward the prize in verse 20 for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you agree with me we ought to be looking for the blessed appearing or the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Wouldn't you agree with that? But, but don't, don't miss what he's saying. Our conversation is where? Where is it? In heaven. In other words, my example ought to match the place that my home is. I've got a home in heaven. I've got a mansion in glory. My, my, place, my, my place is in a city whose builder and maker is God. So listen, can I ask you a question then? Then why in the world, are you, are you, listen, why in the world would I want to listen to some kind of filthy music that would never play in the place I'm headed to if that's where I'm going? Come on, how many of you, how many of you would agree? No sin in heaven. None. None. There's no filth there. There's no, there's no liquor there. There are no drugs there. There's no prostitution there. There's no pornography there. There is nothing like that there because heaven is God's home and it's a place of purity and oh, there's a pure river of life running down through there and Jesus is the light thereof and there's streets made of pure gold and there's, there's beauty ever. Hey, heaven is so much better than America, it's not even a race. So why would I live a life that says, look at the liberty I have when my home in heaven is so unlike that lifestyle? I need to set an example that is consistent with that. Listen, don't, don't you agree with me, whether you do or not, somebody that's lost should see a difference in people that claim to be saved. Because if all we have to offer them is just a better way of life, then we really don't have a whole lot to offer. But I'm going to tell you, we got something a whole lot better to offer than a better way of life, the righteousness of God that lasts for all eternity. We've got a better home. Listen, all I'm saying is we're going to a better place. But then he doesn't finish there. Look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body? Amazing how many commentators said vile doesn't mean vile. How many of you, when you read the word vile, think that's really bad? <laughs> I do. In fact, if you take the word vile and move the word, e, take that letter E and put it in front of the, the V, you got evil. Doesn't that sound pretty bad to you? Who will take and change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Come, I mean, listen, don't, don't you think that Jesus Christ, when he rose that he rose again and he was raised in a body that was full of glory. It was a glorious body. And that body was so different than the one that was laid in that tomb. He now had a body, a body that beat death, incorruptible, undefiled. And all I'm saying, listen, that was so much different Amen. than the one they laid in that tomb. 
And can I say this? Aren't you glad one day? Come on now, help me out now. Some of y'all don't look like you're smiling too much. Aren't you glad one day that this body's going to be totally changed? And I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about the fact you don't have to wear glasses anymore. How many of you are glad you won't have to wear glasses? Or contacts? Or hearing aids? Or false teeth? You won't have to worry about getting a vaccine. You won't ever have to send another payment to an insurance company. No more doctors. No more physical exams. Right. All that's gone. No more creaking bones. No more aspirin. I mean, that's all good. But this body one day that I have struggled with for 55 years, this body one day, that flesh, that flesh is going to be changed. And what's in that flesh one day is not going to be sin. It's going to be a body like unto Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't even know. We can, can, can you conceive never sinning again? Can you conceive never thinking about sinning? Look, there are so many things that happen in life. I was talking with a couple earlier this week, and we were reading the story about Shimei. You remember when David is running from Absalom, and he comes out of, of Jerusalem, and Shimei, one of the sons of Saul, man, he's over there, and he's cursing David, and he's throwing rocks at David. I mean, he's cussing the king and throwing rocks. And Abishai looks at David, and he says, Who is this dead dog? Let me take off his head. And you know what in my heart I want to say? Yeah. Go do it. And David said, no. My son wants to take my life. This man's just cursing me. But the Bible says he's throwing rocks. He said, doesn't matter. There's part of me that wants to rise up in so many different ways. Temptations that I wish were forever gone. But you know what? One day, one day you're going to live that kind of life. Now, now, now listen. If that's true, if the filthy mouth and the filthy mind and all the filth of the flesh is going to be put off, shouldn't I be living like I'm pressing toward the prize instead of enjoying the liberty that one day is going to be finally gotten rid of? Wouldn't you say amen to that? I mean, come on. If I believe I'm going to get a new body and that body is what I'm aiming for and it's got no sin in it, then why would I indulge in sin here? And then th this, this word, this word troubled me. But it helped me when I finished my study. My example of pursuing that prize should be right because of the home that I have and the body that I've been promised. But look what he says at the end of verse 21. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. How many of you would agree with me that Jesus has no problem subduing anything he wants to subdue? He walked on the water. He raised the dead. He took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 people. He looked at a man that was full of devils, a legion, and he cast those devils out. Jesus Christ is able to subdue everything. Well, listen, if he can subdue everything, now look at me. Look, look in verse 21 again. Don't miss it. Who shall change our vile body, that's future, that it may be fashioned like unto his body, according to the working whereby he is able, even to subdue all things unto himself. How many of you think God can help you live a life pressing for the prize instead of just enjoying the liberty? I need that kind of help. I need God to help me bring this body in subjection. To make a way with that temptation that I can escape. I need him to help me with the power that worketh in me that raised him from the dead. Be able to press toward that prize. And I want to do that. And I think about that. There was a time in my life that I was anything but an example for somebody to follow. But God changed those things for me. And you know what I want to do now? I want to be an example that they can follow. I want to be an example my children can follow. Your children can follow. I don't claim to be anything 
or, outside of the ordinary, just an ordinary man. But I want to be an example that Tabernacle Baptist Church can say, preacher, we're going to get in behind you because we know you're pressing toward the prize. I want my example to be right. So Paul says, you know what you need to do? You need to find somebody whose example is right, and you need to follow him. And these people that have a, a life of liberty in Christ, where they have a God as their belly and whose glory is in their shame, and enemies of the cross, you don't need to step that direction. So here's where I want to end the service tonight. I want you to ask yourself just an honest question. What kind of example are you leaving for somebody to follow? Are you leaving an example that if a young man or a young lady or a young couple, if somebody that hadn't been saved very long slips into our church and they begin watching you, how you pray, how you worship, how you sit inside the church building with the Bible open or closed, what you do when you talk about the Lord or you talk about the world, what kind of example are you giving somebody to follow? And you know what I'd, I'd encourage you to do tonight? I'd encourage you to get at that altar right there and say, God, I haven't attained, but where I have attained to, I want to mind the same rule. I want to walk in that fashion. Lord, we do thank you. There's good people here we can follow. God, there's people here that I know are trying to live a life to please you and to know you. We have people, Lord, that have long ago decided that they want nothing that the world has to offer. They want everything that you have to offer. And God, I pray you tonight to help us to see how important our example really is, that, that we're giving somebody something to follow in. And would you please help us as men tonight? Would you please help us as your, your children tonight? Would you help us to set a trail that somebody else could follow? And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd stand to your feet, I'm just going to encourage you to come tonight. Daniel, if you'll go ahead and sing. and Listen, your example does make a difference. He said there are many that are enemies of the cross. How about it tonight? Would you come tonight?